and we've got Linda Paul, who's like a Vegas show act, okay? She's going to warm us up, and we're going to get up, and we're going to get with music. So it's complex stuff, this polyphony, or this counterpoint. So this is imitative counterpoint because there's one idea that keeps coming back and back and back. Now, there's another kind of counterpoint called free counterpoint, where it's highly independent lines uh, are sounding, but uh, they're not imitating one or another. Let's listen to just a section of this. We should have this. It's Louis Armstrong, and we'll talk more about Louis Armstrong as we proceed here. So listen to a good example of, of non-imitative texture, polyphonic texture. Pretty cool stuff, right? Where was Louis Armstrong from? Chicago, actually he did his recordings in Chicago, but he wasn't from Chicago. Where's the heart and soul of jazz in America? New Orleans, right, yeah. That's why it's so important culturally for the history of the United States. So what we want to do now is to begin to think about counting measures, counting measures, counting measures. Uh, and we're going to do this by staying with this piece of, of Louis Armstrong here. And we need to be able to count measures so that we can figure out the syntax of music. Music is a language, and it is made up of a syn syntax. And syntax, you know, consists of phrases and the order in which those phrases occur. But maybe even before we can recognize the syntax of music, we have to figure out what a phrase is. So to do that, we've got to be able to count measures. How do we do this? Well, musicians, again, have developed the following sort of process. Let's say, oftentimes, orchestral musicians, they're sitting there and they're not playing. So they have to be able to count for a long period of time. So they'll be going along in this fashion. Let's say it's duple. One, two, 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 three, two, four, two. They're just adding integers as on each downbeat. It's a very simple, uh, simple idea. Oops, I may have hit the wrong button here. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Think of these poor French horn players in the orchestra. They, have, they play so rarely. And then it's so important when they do play, they'd be up for 78, two, 79, two, 80, two, 81, two. You've got to count forever. We won't have to count quite that long. But even before we count, we've got to figure out what the meter of the music is. So let's start with that now. What's the, uh, let's go back, or I guess we're going to go to the beginning. What's the meter of this piece? And then we'll go ahead and count some measures. So it's duple meter. Our brain has got all that stuff coming in there, and we're probably focusing a lot on the bass and boom, boom, that tuba that's playing there. So let's go on now. We're going to hear Louis Armstrong himself play. What instrument did Louis Armstrong play? Trumpet, Trumpet yeah. And he had this wonderful, rich sound, but boy, it was, it was a big, huge sound, the kind of the ultimate in-your-face trumpet player. So we're going to hear a solo by Louis Armstrong now, and let's count along once the phrase begins. I'll get you started, and then you count the measures. Here we go. Let's start it again. I, I didn't. It started right where, uh, right where the phrase began. Here we go. Ready? What? That's not. No. Just, just go back where you were. That's fine, Linda. That's great. One, two, two, two. Go ahead. And then he disappeared. So how many bars did you count there? How long was the phrase that Louis Armstrong played? Eight measures? Everybody agree with that? Anybody say seven? Better say eight in music. Asymmetry is not the norm in music. So eight's a, eight's a good bet there. Let's go back and hear another solo. It's a wonderful clarinet solo by, by someone named Johnny Dobb. Long dead, of course, but it's one of the most beautiful, incredible clarinet solos you'll ever want to hear. How long is this? Uh, solo. How long is this phrase here by Johnny Dobb? Here we go. One, two, two, two.
16. So twice as long. But that, that, that's, that's sort of good news. A lot of music is made up of these 2-4 and 4-4 four, four, uh, sorts of aggregate. Uh, and then we'll just go on to listen to the end of this where everybody's in. It's hard to know again what the melody is or what the phrase is here. Is just everybody playing. Remember, are they using music here? Could these gentlemen read music? It's not clear that this particular group could. It's all, I'm sure Louis Armstrong would read some music, but again, it would just get in the way of what he's doing. All of this was, was orally, um, orally transmitted and orally taught. So let's listen to the end of it. It's called Willie the Weeper. You're going to have it as one of your listening exercises. Let's listen to the end of it here. <coughs> Okay, here we go with our phrase. Call that, is there anybody in high school band here? What do you call that thing? Boom! <coughs> at the end. Do you still call it that? Stinger at the end? Sort of a syncopated bounce at the end of the thing? How, how long was that particular phrase? 16 bars there again. And it's a, a perfect example of free counterpoint. You've got the trombone, the clarinet, the trumpet, they're all just doing their own thing in the context of the harmonies that are playing out here. And it's just, it's just magical. Just magical, I think. What happy music, right? How could you possibly be sad when listening to that kind of music? And they play this kind of music coming back from funerals. You know, you're dancing into heaven with that kind of thing. Yeah, I bet there's heavenly music of that sort. Uh, okay, now let's go on to another thing that we'll want to be doing here, and that.